¿Este cuánto vale? Uh, mucho caro. This is how a way of life can be destroyed by bulldozers and by banknotes. Most of all, by the fatal touch of other people. <laughs> Colombia, South America, in the headwaters of a remote river. Negro traders bargain ruthlessly with an Indian for his chickens. It's a familiar story. A man with little squeezes a man with less. This time, Negro exploits Indian. The Indians retreat further up the river. This is how it's been for a hundred years. But today, the Indians face a less patient enemy. And this time, there's no bargaining and no retreat. For now, the road is coming. <laughs> The Embra Indians live in the headwaters of two rivers, the Baudo and the Atrato. This area along the Pacific coast of Colombia is known as the Choco. Today, there are about 10,000 Embera. They faced extinction once before. 400 years ago, the Spanish conquistadors came here for gold. The Embera refused to work their mines, and many were massacred. So the Spaniards had to bring in slaves from Africa. With the emancipation of slaves in 1851, the liberated Negroes, now known as Libres, were able to leave the mining areas. They moved westwards, up the river valleys, to settle on Indian land. The Embera retreated into the headwaters, but they have no legal rights to their land. And now, without consulting them, the Colombian government is driving the last section of the Pan American Highway straight across their territory. The highway is the final link on the vast project which spans a whole continent from Alaska to Cape Horn. For millions of people in Latin America, it looks like the beginning of change and perhaps the beginning of hope. But for the Embra, it may well be the end of the road. The Embra are a river people. Fishing, hunting, and growing food, their lives revolve around the river. And scattered along its banks are their houses. Raised on stilts as a protection against one of the wettest climates on earth, the house is the basic unit of Embera society, a home for all the generations of a single family. Early morning, Heraclio, the head of one Embera family, returns from hunting. French anthropologist Ariane de Luce has lived with the Embra for two years. You can see when you live in such an Indian family for some weeks or some months, you really have the impression of living in a very polite, uh, upper class, European or British family. Few words are exchanged, things are always discussed in common between parents. Well, you have really the impression of being in Europe, much more than when you are in a, in a Libre family, where the relationship has not this touch of loveliness and uh, companionship.
natural interest of the children always uh, are pretty well encouraged and the differences between the children are pretty apparent. They are not done all, all in the same mode. Flore Milo is the head of this family. He's also a shaman, one who cures. Parents are very affectionate to the children, grandparents to their grandchildren, but not in a very demonstrative manner. José Israel has travelled through the forest for two hours in search of this tree. For the job he has in mind, the wood must be resinous, long-lasting and light. A stripped palm stalk is his measuring rod, and three arm spans is the length of his new family canoe. Once the Embera had stone axes. Now, after contact with Spaniards and Libres, they have steel tools. They're amongst the most skilled canoe makers in South America. An Embera canoe will last the family as long as five years. headwaters of the Bauda River. Wild animals used to be plentiful in this area. Now the Ember count themselves lucky if they can track down a single wild pig. Today they're in luck. The pig has been driven to ground and trapped in a hole. The hunters build a barrier at the entrance to the hole. They have very typified uh, characters, typified and distinct characters. Some are gay, some are sad, uh, some are active, some are not active, uh, some are interested by a precise activity, not by another one. One is hunting. Rio Verde, for example, is a hunter.
The meat will be shared out among the family. The skin stretched, cured, and then sold to the libres. They have learned to, to make tools or to adapt older tools to new functions. They have, seem to have completely uh, refused or not accepted plastic. One has the impression that any innovation is taken, tracked, and then either accepted or uh, rejected. people who, who have a sense of their bodies. I mean, they are fantastically clean. They go every morning and every night, wash entirely in the river and wash their children. They like to have a pleasant smell. They like perfume, nice clothes for women. There are no chiefs. The minimum of authority is exerted by the head of a household, who may be very young, because people choose to live on their own with wives and children. So if you accept the authority of the head of a household, it's in a voluntary way. Anyway, there are no councils. There are no secret societies, so things seem to function very well in the most simple way. <clears throat> Jose Israel has been working on his canoe now for three days. His skill is surprising, for he's a refugee from civilization. When he was 12 years old, a priest took him away from his Indian home and sent him to a Catholic mission school in a large Colombian town. He became a good student and a choir boy in the cathedral. But after three years, new priests took over and they didn't want to support him. So he came back to his family in the forest. Then he had to learn everything from the traditional life of the Indians. He had to learn canoeing, hunting, and everything. And he made it well and cleverly. He's educating his sons and trying to get for them what he couldn't have. However, Jose Israel is an ambiguous personality because he has the glory of having been out, but I would say slightly and rightly bitter about what happened to him. The best land for growing crops is in the side creeks behind the main rivers. Often the family will come and work here for two or three days at a time. The almost continuous rainfall has forced a curious farming technique on the Embera. Since the jungle won't burn, they clear the undergrowth, sow the crop, and then fell the large trees over the seed to let in the sunlight. In only three and a half months, maize will grow through the rotting timbers and be ready for harvest. Hueso is the cultivator of this family. Like Jose Israel, he's been thrown off balance by contact with the outside world. He was brought up in a Spanish-speaking school and cannot speak his native tongue.
Like other traditional embera skills, making clay pots is dying out. It's always been a woman's job, but now only a few old women still know how it's done. Heraklio and his wife are firing the pots which were made by his old mother. The Embera believe that the pots must be made and later fired during a rising moon, otherwise they'll break. <coughs> Molten beeswax mixed with charcoal is poured into the pots. When it dries, the mixture strengthens the pots and makes them watertight. Today, pots like these are a rarity amongst the Embera. As the traditional skill dies, they're coming to rely on the mass-produced aluminium bowls they get from the Libres. Two or three times a year, the Embera make the three-day journey downstream to the Libre villages. The Embera come to trade, to buy goods, and to see something of the curious world outside the forest. <laughs> Indians do despise the Libres. We are nearly are not considered as human beings by the Indians. We happen to speak of them as animals or reincarnation of animals. It's obvious that Indians despise Libras. It's obvious too that Libras despise Indians. The Libras take advantage in a way of having some better education. Of being more skilled. Uh, in their way of moving in the, in the world. <laughs> I mean, they ex exert a sort of terror, I would say, on the Indians. But one must not forget that these Libres, who are trying in a way to exploit the Indians, are themselves uh, exploited by global society, or are at least quite apart from the Colombian nation. They live in an area of Baudo, which has absolutely no communication until now. They are more and more numerous. They have no possibility of selling the produce of their work when they are agriculturists. And they are trying desperately to escape their conditions. The only people whom they find below themselves, below themselves, they conceive them below themselves, are the Indians. In the forest, Flore Milo, the old shaman, cuts a ceremonial prayer star from an old piece of cedar wood. The staff should be four hands long, four because this is a magical number to the Embera. The carving of the staff is the first act in the preparation of a curing ceremony. During the ceremony, Flore Milo will cure members of his family. Most important of all, his own wife, who's been lying ill for some months. Materials for a curing ceremony begin to arrive. This load of maize and sugar cane will be fermented into chicha, a beer drunk at feasts and ceremonies. 
people are born, live and die nearly without any medical help. And in a Baudo especially, they better resent it. Well, shamanism is probably one of the best health devices they have because all the psychosomatic disease, anyway, are very well cured by the shaman. So shamans are help, but they can't cure everything. As he carves, Flore Milo communes with the ancestral spirits, the Heis. When it's finished, the staff will be given to a pupil who's learning to become a shaman. The shaman is the specialist in contacting the supernatural world. He can appease the evil spirits, the ember of fear in hunted animals. And then he can cure sickness with the help of the benevolent spirits of the ancestors. Now the house itself must be prepared for the curing ceremony. It's purified with sweet-smelling leaves. The house is isolated from all evil animal spirits. Other members of the family carve a ritual boat. The human figures represent the ancestors who will embark in it and travel from the spirit world to take part. Florimilo hopes that these ancestral spirits, the Hais, will come to the house and help him cure his sick wife. But as the preparations go on, there's also time to take care of his grandson's diarrhea. Having drawn out the illness, he blows the evil away and calls the ancestors by waving leaves. The gourds are to hold the chicha. They must be engraved to keep away evil animal spirits. Preparation of the chicha beer goes on. The sugar cane is squeezed to force out the juice. When it's mixed with the maize, it'll bring on rapid fermentation. Flore Milo begins the detailed carving of the spirit image. His glasses were given to him years ago by a missionary. Flore Milo's granddaughters chew up the ground maize. Their saliva helps fermentation. Boiling the cane juice will also speed up the fermentation process. Floremilo's skill as a healer was learnt from other shamans, and the more instructors he's had, the more spirits he can call on. Rio Verde, the hunter, paints his face with hagua, a dark blue dye made from a jungle fruit. The Embera believe the dye has magical qualities. <laughs> At nightfall, the altar is erected between the four central posts of the house. You become a shaman after having yourself uh, endured a crisis, a crisis where you see spirits or where you are possessed by spirits. And in order to be cured, you have to accept the spirit. 
coming into you and yourself becoming a shasham. Morning. Flore Milo sleeps after a night long ceremony. His granddaughters mix the gourds of chicha which have been fermenting on the altar all night and hand them round to everyone. The family are convinced the level of the liquid has dropped. They now know that the ancestors have come to the house and drunk. The ceremony promises success. Another reason for celebration, Jose Israel's canoe is brought home to be finished. The effort of carrying it through the forest is reason enough for drinking more chicha, maybe for three or four days. <laughs> this visit in the middle of the celebrations was a surprise to everyone. A Roman Catholic priest from the mission station down the river. What we Indians would like is a direct contact uh, with uh, Spanish white uh, society. And it is probably one of the reasons why we have been so docile and obedient with the missionaries. It's because the missionaries encountered in them a certain sense of superiority, which we naturally have about the Libras. Jose Israel makes the most of the priest's visit. He wants his son Gabriel to have a better future than himself. 
and he complains that he's learned nothing during his last year at the mission school. Padre Francisco assures him that in future things at the mission will get better. <laughs> For 30 years, the lives of the Ember on this river have been tightly controlled by a Catholic mission a day's journey downstream. Justice and education, as well as religion, have all been dispensed by the mission. The priests come up river to take young children away to school and to remind the Indians of the Roman Catholic faith. On this visit, Padre Francisco prepares to give mass. We don't say anything. We don't have a. We, we don't have an open attitude. So it helps them saving from the church, and it helps them <laughs> saving from any contact. Superficially, one can see that the Catholic faith doesn't seem to be very strong and seems to be a sort of superstition. Saying goodbye to the Indians in this way, Padre Francisco disregards a fundamental Embra rule. When an Embra leaves, he goes silently, often furtively, without saying a word.
for the last 80 years, the Roman Catholic Church in Colombia has exercised complete religious and civil control over what are called mission territories. This means that two-thirds of the country is under church control. I have been able to see different stages of a mission. A stage when the mission was a flourishing enterprise, well, in a way, making money. Some priests of, with some more modern ideas came uh, in the last years and tried to make a sort of deeper evangelization and tried more or less to help to the Indians to, to keep their customs. Uh, then I came back some months later. Older priests had come back. And there seemed to be a complete economic decadence of the mission. And now one can say that this mission is properly collapsing. Upriver from the mission, the Embra get on with living their own way. But they know that change is coming fast, and they worry about what it'll mean to them. Flore Milo's family talked about their fears to Ariane de Luce, the anthropologist. There was a school in this area, wasn't there? Yes, there was a school. It was the school of the priests. But it's fallen down. It fell down and they took away the schoolmaster. Now we are completely abandoned here. Neither the priests nor anyone else cares about us. The Libres, the Negroes, molest us Indians a lot. They come up from the Choco to do business and they sell their goods at very high prices. They bring their dogs and they sell them for vast amounts of money. Sometimes 1,000 pesos sometimes 800. The lowest price is 600 pesos. And if an agreement isn't reached, they try and find a way to kill us Indians. There's been a lot of this happening, so I want these people to be stopped from coming onto our land anymore. We want to keep our own race apart so that no one interferes with us. The road is coming from over there and with it will come all these people. The robbers and bandits, the people who molest us. They're coming to take our land away from us to rob us. Because of this we want to get legal rights to our land. We want to talk to the president of Colombia. But since we don't have any money, we can't go and see him. But for a little while longer, life can go on as always. Flore Milo and his family are off to another party, but his wife is still ill at home. This time is to celebrate the felling of a new maize plantation an excuse for everyone on the river to come and enjoy themselves at a guarapo, a party where everyone drinks fermented sugarcane juice. Noise has always been an essential element. An old tale tells of the traditional Embra hero drawn upstream by the sound of the Guarapa drums. 
Now Flore Milo and his family are drawn by a battery-operated gramophone and Colombian pop music. Fermented cane juice is much more potent than the maize beer of the curing ceremony. So the guarapo is a time for letting go, for unwinding from family tensions and daily problems. It's a time for dancing, shouting, singing, and even fighting. The noise of the guarapo is also a signal for libre traders. They know that when the ember are drunk, they can mingle with them and sell their goods at extortionate prices. A drunk Flore Milo complains to the Libre, we Indians are the poorest people in Colombia and we need help. The Indians want these dogs and the Libre manage usually to come up when they know that there is a drinking party, a warapo, and people are very drunk and very tired too. Then the Libres come in, offer their, their dogs to people who are not quite themselves, I would say. And very often after the Indians are very unhappy to have done these deals, but they dare not change it. These people have been denied their natural rights for 500 years. For the men of the street and for many officials, the Indians are to be civilized. We simply don't know or forget that they are civilized, but they are civilized in their own civilization. They don't see that they are in a position where they can't resist the enormous pressure of our civilization upon theirs, and that the only result of it will do that their civilization will disappear, and then that way we will become tramps. Uh, 